Good morning. Hey, I'm Joelle. I'm the teaching pastor, I guess, around here. That's what they call me, teaching pastor. I'm honored to get to serve under pastor. Our senior pastor is Pastor Marcus and Natalie. And uh, I just still can't believe we've been here five years. It's crazy. They kept me here for five years. Yeah. We're continuing our series today called Build It, where we're talking about building your life on the foundation of the things that Christ taught. So when I was in my 20s, uh, a friend of mine invited me to do something that sounded like a whole lot of fun to me. He said, hey, you know, in China, it is illegal to have Bibles that haven't been printed by the Chinese government, and they've edited what they want in their Bibles. So they're, you're allowed to get Bibles in China, but only a certain kind of Bible that has what they want in that Bible. And you're only allowed to go to certain churches in China, the ones that the government has said, these people teach what we want them to teach. It's very, it's communist government. And they do not like Christianity. So he said, we're going to smuggle some Bibles into China. They're big study Bibles that'll be for pastors who have never had any formal Bible training. They never went to a seminary or Bible school. And it's going to help them teach their congregations. Because in China at that time, they would have a pastor that maybe he would preach off of one sheet of a Bible that somebody gave him one page, and he would preach off of that to a crowd of hundreds of, maybe sometimes even thousands of people who would meet secretly in homes because it was illegal to, to meet and go to church. So I, my friend said, do you want to come with me to smuggle Bibles? I was like, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're 20, 20 years old. You think you're invincible? Like, yeah, of course I want to do that. It sounds so cool. I get to do something illegal for Jesus. So... <laughs> We, we flew into Hong Kong, which at the time was a lot more free than it is now. China has been, uh, they, China took back Hong Kong from England a few years ago, and they've slowly been kind of assimilating Hong Kong into the Chinese communist system. But at the time, it was still pretty free. So we all flew into Hong Kong, and they took us, and we got our Bibles that we would take. They were called fire Bibles, really cool Bibles for pastors, pretty thick little, little guys. And they took us to this place, and they said, all right, here's, here's your bag, your secret bag. And we would open these suitcases, and the bottom would have a false bottom, and you'd lift it up, and you could slip the Bibles in there perfectly. And once it was closed, you couldn't see through an x-ray machine that it had a fake bottom in it. So we put our Bibles in there, and then we threw clothes on top. And I, I, my mind, I'll never forget, I was, after the second run, I came back and looked at the clothes that were actually in my suitcase. And I realized there was a bra in there. I'm like, oh, I better, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit, right? Uh, nowadays, I could just go, how dare you question my identity today? But anyway... <laughs> This was back when the world was still sane. So we, uh, we, the way we did it was we would divide up into teams of two. And, uh, and, and you would have your bag, and the team of two, we would go on the first train. So this train, this crossing from Hong Kong to China, at the time, like a million people crossed by foot every day from Hong Kong into mainland China. So you, we would try and blend in as much as a tall, skinny, white guy could blend in with... Uh, so... <laughs> We got our bags, and I went with the first team. And they said, now, don't act like you know each other. If you see each other in the waiting room or as you're crossing the border, you know, just ignore each other. You don't know each other. So we would all cross individually, and we would, we would meet up on the other side in this hotel room. And there was going to be a guy waiting in the lobby at the hotel room at the train station for us. So I'll never forget the nerves. You're just like, your heart's beating like, you know, trying to stay calm, stay calm, stay calm, you know. I, I, I'm not like some of you guys. I had never broken the law before. So I'm just, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. It's a joke. But uh it was, uh, it, was, it was really nerve-wracking for me. Well, I made it through. Like, they, they, sur- they scanned my bag, but they didn't see the Bibles in it. So I'm like, yes, I made it through. So I'm like calmly walking through. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah. But I'm looking back. Did my friends make it? So we loaded our bags into this room, and we s- slowly built up the number of Bibles we had. And after we had done that for two days, crossing the border in the morning and then in the afternoon, so there would be different border guards in the afternoon, um, we had enough Bibles amassed. So we texted this guy. And we met him, we, we took all of our stuff quietly, you know, went up to the third floor of this hotel, walked out into the parking garage, a guy pulled up in a black truck, we shook his hand, loaded up the Bibles, he said thank you, and he took off, and then he distributed those Bibles throughout the country to these pastors that didn't have access to them. And I remember sitting there thinking, you know, I've grown up with the Bible my whole life. I've had multiple Bibles in my home, like 30, 40 Bibles. My dad was a pastor. We got lots of Bibles. So I remember thinking, it's so crazy that a government would be so paranoid about a book, about what would be contained in a book that they would make it illegal. Like, we weren't in that much of a risk, right? Maybe we'd get our hands slapped, maybe we'd get our visa revoked, maybe they'd put us in a holding cell for a while, but they wouldn't hold us. But our Chinese brothers and sisters, they were running a real risk of a threat, potentially to their lives, for carrying around this Bible that was, wasn't sanctioned by the Chinese government. I started thinking, what is it about the Bible 
that makes people so paranoid. And, and then a verse came to my mind, something, something that uh, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, you know, the Word of God, the Bible, is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged, double-edged sword. It says it, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. The Bible really, in many ways, is a weapon. Now, you may have experienced this where somebody used that weapon of the sword as a way to strike you down. They use the Bible against you as a way to try and strike you down and put you in your place. But you know, a sword can be used to fight, but it can also be used to point the way. And oftentimes we've seen that people throughout history have used the Bible as as a sword of theirs to strike people down the way they want to do. But the, the Bible is a sword against the enemy that's coming against you. And the enemy is never people. The enemy is the spirit behind what's driving people. And so a lot of times you've seen people that have used the Bible in the wrong way because it is powerful, because it is truth. But you've seen people wield truth in a way that wasn't the right way because we're supposed to speak the truth in love. And a a sword can be used to lop off someone's head, but it can also be used to point the way. And the Bible is so powerful. And that's what I think is so dangerous about the Bible is that it's full of truth. And truth is always a threat to lies. And we live in a world that operates predominantly on lies, falsehoods, and fakeness. And the Apostle Paul is saying, the Bible cuts through all that. The truth that's in the Bible can cut through all that. He says this, it divides soul and spirit. Like, what does that mean? Well, the spirit of God that's living within you is very closely connected to your soul. But your soul and your spirit are different. Your soul is your, like your emotions and your thoughts. And sometimes you'll think that you'll, you'll feel something so strongly, you'll think maybe it's even God speaking to you. And the only way to know the difference between whether it's God speaking to you or your emotions speaking to you or whether it's actually God speaking to you is the Holy Spirit will God, through the Bible will cut through and say, nope, actually that's just your feelings and your feelings are lying to you because your feelings are really good at lying to you. And if you trust them, they'll lie to you. And sometimes though, it's God saying something through your feelings for you to do something and the word of God will show you, yep, that's the right thing. It'll cut right and it'll say, yep, that's the right thing for you to do. The spirit of God is in agreement with what you're feeling right now. A lot of times you don't feel it, but you have to do it. So the word of God is what helps you get clarity on whether is this God telling me to do this or is this just my feelings? And it says it cuts between joints and marrows. It says it judges the the thoughts and attitudes of the heart and nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. If there's any corruption, any deception, the Word of God, as it's, as it's lived out, will eventually reveal that to the world around you. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. The Word of God is the foundation. We as Christians believe it is the foundation of truth in our lives. And if you want access to truth, if you're trying to find direction in your life, if you're trying to conquer addiction, if you're trying to conquer that depression, if you're trying to beat something that's trying to take you out, you whip out that sword of truth and that will guide the way to get you to where you need to go. And so we're we're doing a series right now called Build It, right? And it's based on this thing that Jesus said. He says, therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash because it was built on the wrong foundation. And then we talked last week about how it says when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. They're like, who is this guy? He speaks with so much authority because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. And we talked about last week how if you really want to, like if you've got a new house and you're like, what's, something's not quite, not quite right with the house or I can't figure out what's going on with the house. If you call the builder, that builder intricately knows every system in that house and what's going on. He helped with the plumbing He oversaw the electrical. He oversaw the foundation. The builder knows what they've built really well. And if you want answers to what's going wrong in your house, the builder knows. And that's what Jesus, that's why he was able to speak with authority. He said, guys, I was there in the beginning. We we looked at that verse last week. It says, in the beginning was the word, the logos, which is essentially, it's translated as the word, which is what we now consider the Bible. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has 
been made. And through him was the light, and the light shone in the darkness. And it says, and the darkness can never overcome the light. You've seen that. If you've ever been in a dark place, you flip on some light, darkness can't win. Light will always win. And that is the power of what's the truth that's in the Bible. When you shine it into darkness, the light is always going to win. And that's why Christians are so adamant about the Bible. Right? Why are they so stuck and hung up on the Bible? And some Christians, they get really goofy about the Bible. Right? They're like, we only read one translation, the King James Version. That was good enough for Jesus. Jesus used the King James Version, right? <laughs> no, Jesus didn't use the King James Version, right? So we get hung up on these translations. Well, this is the only translation. And, and listen, if, you, if you're one of those people, God bless you. Let's let it go for today. We're going to talk about the Bible and the power of the truth that's in the Bible. And you can worry about the translation later, okay? Um, for, for the record, I'll be using the ESV. So <laughs> all Scripture, Paul says, is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, as I was preparing this message, I was like, how in the world am I going to narrow down talking about the Bible to 30 minutes? Because it, like, you could do 365 sermons about the Bible and still not exhaust all that could be taught about the Bible. We could talk about how the Bible, everywhere it's gone, it's changed countries and changed nations, it's improved societies. We could talk about how the Bible is, a, is, is, is deep truth that's constantly being revealed to us. But I was like, how do you figure out, how do you convince people that they need the Bible in their life? And I was, I was thinking about something that happened right at the beginning of COVID. My daughter came down with a case of really bad hives. And she, uh, she it was really bad. So we called her doctor and we said, can you see our daughter and, and see what's going on? She's like, well, COVID, we don't know what's going on. We don't want you in the doctor's office. Just give her Benadryl and Advil, and she'll be fine in a few days. I was like, that's it? She's like, yep, every six hours. So we started giving her Benadryl and Advil. The hives would not go away, and she's just, I mean, rough nights. We couldn't sleep. She's just itchy, 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 itchy. I was like, oh my gosh. So I called the doctor a few days later. I said, look, it's not going away. And she's like, well, are you giving Benadryl and Advil? I'm like, yes, every six hours. She's like, well, add Zyrtec or Allegra to it. So I was like, okay. So she added Zyrtec and Allegra. The hives still didn't go away, and it was getting bad. Five days in, Finally, I'm like, we have got to see the doctor. So I called the doctor, and I was like, you've got to see my doctor. Well, we can't do it. I'm like, no, this is not going away. We've been doing everything you said, and it's not going away. She said, well, come on in. Call me when you get to the parking lot, and we'll figure out what to do. So I'm on my way to the doctor, and uh, my sister called. She's like, what you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm taking a lease to the doctor for these hives. And she's like, oh, I got something that'll cure those hives right away. And I'm like, what is it? She said, uh, come on over by the house. So we swung by my sister's house on the way, and she came out, and she had a little baggie with dried green leaves in it. <laughs> She's like, here, this will do the trick. And she took a little scoop, and she put it in some applesauce and gave it to my daughter. And I was like, oh, it doesn't hurt. Ever, nothing else is working, right? By the time, in the 10-minute drive from my sister's house to the doctor, the hives had like 99% gone away. I was like, whoa. This stuff's amazing. So I was like, well, do I go home? Do I go to the doctor? I'm like, well, we're already at the doctor. It took this long to get here. So I call the doctor. She said, come on up. So we come up and put our mask on, full body suit. You know, it's crazy. You remember those days. We get up there, and she's like, oh, it looks like the Benadryl's working. I'm like, no, the Benadryl's not working. I was like, it's this little bag of dried green leaves my, my sister gave me that's working. And I remember having the video camera out. Emily was gone at the time, so I wanted to video what the doctor advised. So I videoed what the doctor was about to advise me. And what I ended up with is a video of the doctor rebuking me. She said, don't be giving your daughter green dried leaves that you don't even know what it is. That hasn't been tested by the FDA. It's not approved by the WHO. The CDC hasn't. And I'm like, well, I was like, but it's natural. She's like, I don't care if it's natural. It's not approved. It hasn't been tested and approved through da 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 and this and that. I'm like, in my mind, I'm thinking, lady, I'm grateful that you're a doctor. But something that works, that I don't understand, is far superior to something I understand completely that does not work. I'm going to keep giving my kid those nettles. They were nettles, by the way. This is not medical advice, FYI. Not FDA approved. Don't give your kid nettles for hives. Anyway. But, but, my point, but it works. <laughs> so here's my, but here's my point. A lot of times we say, well, I don't understand what's in the Bible. You don't have to understand everything that's in the Bible for it to work for you. Because it's truth that always works. And you say, well, and and if you can maybe just grasp a little bit of the truth in the Bible, it will change your life. 
So don't be intimidated by the fact that you don't understand it. Because let me tell you a little secret. I've been reading the Bible for 40 plus years. I don't understand it either. My dad's a pastor. He don't understand it either. We understand a lot that's in it, hopefully. Like, I, I like to think I understand a little bit of this in it, but the more I read it, the more I realize I don't even have a drop in the bucket of the depth of truth that's in the Bible. Sometimes I'm reading Paul, and I'm going, Paul, what the heck are you talking about? Why can't you just speak plainly, man? And, and it's encouraging to me because Peter, the guy that hung out with Jesus, there's one point in the Bible where he says that. He's like, I don't understand what Paul's talking about. But I know he's on to something, so listen to him. Peter actually said that. It's in there. It's in the Bible. And I, I, that's encouraging to me because sometimes I read Paul, I'm like, what in the world? But then other times I'll be reading Paul, and I'll be reading this thing, and I'm like, I've blown past it in the years and years, many times. And all of a sudden, it speaks right to a situation that I'm in. I'm like, oh, that's what that means. I didn't even understand. Because truth has to reveal itself slowly to you because truth is really big. And the logos the word that is God's truth that came down in the form of Jesus is really big. It's so big that if we knew it all, it would crush us. So God in his grace gives us the truth we need at the time we need it, in the situation we need it. But you're not going to get access to that truth if you're not accessing the truth through the word of God. There's two important things we believe about the Bible. We first believe that the Bible is infallible. It is incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. It's never failing and always effective. The Bible will always have answers to your depression, to your financial struggle, to your marriage struggle, to your struggle with your kids. The Bible will always have the answer if you seek it out. And it may not look like what you thought it was, but the answer will be in there. And you don't even have to understand all of why God says what he says, but if you apply it, it will work. And that's why we believe, that's why we're so hardcore about the Bible is infallible. And some people say, well, I read stuff in there and there's no way those numbers are accurate. Listen, I'm not going to get into an argument about you whether the numbers were accurate because the Eastern mind, the way they think in the East versus the way we think in the West with our enlightenment, like 400 years ago, we had this logical shift where we're like, if you can't prove it, we can't believe it, which is nonsense, right? So a lot of the East they look at numbers, they look at time differently. And if you're reading it from our Western mind and going, well, that number surely can't match up, you're missing the point. The point is this, when it comes to how to live your life in a moral, right, successful way, the Bible's got the truth, the corner on it, and it will never fail to give you that. And you can argue, well, I don't know about those numbers. That's, that's your goofy Western mind. Forget about that. Focus on the deep moral truths in there, and you'll never go wrong because the Bible will never lead you astray. The second thing we believe about the Bible is this. It is inspired. Expired, inspired simply means of extraordinary quality as if arising from some external creative impulse that is breathed in. So we believe human people just like us wrote the Bible, but it was God speaking truth through them. You've probably had a moment like that in your life where you spoke something, you're like, well, that was from somewhere deeper than me because I could never come up with that. But it was God speaking through you. And we believe the whole Bible was written by normal humans who are inspired by God. And the Bible throughout it has truth. Now, here's the important thing to understand about the Bible, okay? The Bible is not a book. It is a library. It's 66 different books. So if you read through the Bible, you've read a whole library of books. In fact, this fall, we're going to be starting something in our small groups for those who want to take on the challenge, where we're going to read the Bible from cover to cover over a three-year period. When you go through this program, we're going to start in the fall. If you go through this program and commit to it, you will have read the entire Bible from beginning to end. With that in mind, I'm going to do something that I was debating whether to do it in the first service, and it went fairly well, so I'm going to try it again, okay? I'm going to do my best. For those of you who are like, I don't even know where to start in the Bible, I'm going to give you an overview of the entire Bible, like 3,000 years of writing, in eight minutes. Think I can pull it off? I tried five in the first, couldn't pull it off. We're going to go with eight minutes, right? So I'm going to go through this real quick. And if you're like, whoa, this is fascinating. I didn't know all that was in there. Look, it's a whole book of the history of God's interaction with mankind and, find, and, and, discover, and, and him setting up a way for us to be in right relationship with him. So the book of Genesis starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made a perfect environment, but we fell for a lie that there could be more than what we already had that was perfect. And we fell in sin. And from that moment on, God started building a story in of how he was going to redeem humankind 
from their own sins. And we see the story, sin got so bad that Noah, God had to call out Noah and say, Noah, I got to wipe out the earth and I'm going to start again with you. Noah builds the ark. He starts again. Noah has these three sons. From them came a guy named Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, through you, I'm going to basically use your family lineage to bring the king of the world, my own son, Jesus, into the world who's going to save you from your sins. But I got to set y'all apart first. I got to create this special lineage for Jesus to come from. And so he started with Abraham, and Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and God eventually changed Jacob's name to Israel. This is all in the book of Genesis, right? And Jacob, his name's Israel, he ends up with these sons, and the, his, his sons, well, it's ten, and then, 10 sons and two grandsons, all take on the names that became the tribes of Israel. You've heard of the 12 tribes of Israel? Those were the sons of Jacob. And through each of them, he said, I'm going to create a great nation. Well, Long story short, one of the sons, Joseph, goes, and we know the story of Joseph, the prince of Egypt, if you remember the Disney movie. He ends up going to Egypt. His family, uh, he's actually sold into slavery in Egypt. His family ends up getting saved from a famine when they go to Egypt, and Joseph's already said, hey, he's already set up shop there, and he's like, I'm going to take care of you. And so he takes care of them, but eventually they turn into slaves there after they've lived there for a long time. And the Pharaoh starts making them slaves because he's like, man, these Jewish people, these Israelites, they're expanding like crazy. They're going to take us over. So he turns them into slaves, and then God raises up a guy named Moses. And that's what the story of Exodus is about, where God says, Moses, I didn't intend for these tribes of Israel to live here in Egypt. I want them back in, in Israel. So I'm going to use you to take them back there. And so Moses rises up, and he takes them out of the, you know, we know the whole story. He takes them out of Egypt and brings them back to the land of Israel. But it takes a long time to get there because they get afraid. They're afraid to take their destiny and go, go after what God's put in front of them. So they end up wandering in the wilderness. And during that time in the wilderness, God says, you know what? I'm going to set some rules out for you, set, set some standards for you to live by, and you're probably not, not going to be able to live by them. But if you'll live by them, the closer you live by them, the more you'll be walking in alignment with what I have for you in your life. And so that's what the book of Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, are the story of, of, of God building out a, a, a framework for a nation that he would use to bring Jesus into the world. These first five books are what are called the Pentateuch, five penta, or as the, the, he, the Jews call them, they call it the Torah. So if you've ever heard of the Torah, that's what they're referring to, these first five books of Torah. The story of Joshua is the story of the conquest of them getting back into the land. The story uh, of Judges is the story of them getting into the land getting fat and happy and then forgetting about God. So God's like, hey, don't forget about me. And they're like, well, everything's pretty good. I don't need God. So God says, watch this. And he starts letting evil oppressors come in from all around them and start taking over Israel and making their life really hard. So God raises up a series of judges. And I'm telling you, this is the most R-rated book in the Bible right here. If you want to read something violent and R-rated, there's a, there's a story of a guy in there named Ehud. He was one of the judges. There's this king that's oppressing the Israelites and he takes a sword and he sneaks into the king's thing king's uh, quarters and the, the king is so fat that he had runs the sword all the way through the king and then puts his fat layer over the sword so nobody will see it and so the king is laying there dying and nobody can even nobody even realizes what's happening and Ehud delivers the people of Israel there's tons of violent stuff in there if you like there's another story a lady that took a tent stake and drove it through a guy's head crazy stuff who says the Bible's boring Ruth Ruth is the story of how God said, you know what? All these people around you, all these tribes around you that I was going to make a special nation out of Israel, I'm going to also incorporate those people. So he brought Ruth in as the story of this lady from Moab who actually gets taken into the lineage of those who become the kings of Israel and, the, and eventually the lineage of Jesus Christ. So it's a story about God including other people who should have been far off and bringing them in. Then you get through uh, the story of the kings here, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. This is the story of where they call out to God and they're like, we want a king. And he's like, you don't want a king. A king will make your life miserable. He'll make you pay taxes. I'll be your king. And they're like, no, we want a king. And he's like, fine, I'll send you a king. But don't be calling out to me when he makes your life miserable. So there's this story. Right? It's like it's the ups and downs of the Bible, right? So then we get to these. These are, called, these are what are uh, some of the prophets here. This is the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, they get sent off into slavery in Babylon. Nehemiah is the guy that rebuilds the wall. Fascinating book. If you're a visionary trying to figure out what to, how to build your life and how to build your business, Nehemiah has a great story of how to build something from scratch, right? Esther is the story of a lady who she, she basically wins a, she wins a beauty pageant, and God uses her beauty to save Israel crazy story. You're like, what? It's in there. I'm telling you. Job. 
Fascinating thing about Job, Job probably should be over here. It's probably the oldest book in the Bible. It's the story of how God interacts with us in our suffering and why good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Reverse that. Why bad things happen to good people. It's a very challenging book. These are what are called the wisdom books. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. These were written by, um, by uh, so- Solomon and King David and, and another guy named Asaph. This is, I think Psalms is the best book for figuring out how to relate well to God. And I think Proverbs is the best book for how to relate well to man. Ecclesiastes, hands down my favorite book of the Bible. Then we go into what are called the major prophets. These are the prophets that had major things to say. Jeremiah, man, it was a fascinating book because Jeremiah is like this really sad book about all the things that God is so disappointed in Israel about. But right in the middle of that is some of the most hopeful verses like, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to take you to a bright future. Jeremiah is full of that. These are the major prophets, and then these are the minor prophets. I really feel like Joel should be included in the majors, but we're in the minors, so I'm, I'm quadruple A here. So then these are the prophets, and then these are the last, verse, the, the last prophets where Jesus, God basically says, look, I know you guys have really screwed up our relationship. Like, you've really messed this up. You keep, like, I make things good for you, and then you run away and from me, and then I bring you back, and everything's good. But look, eventually I'm going to send a guy, my own son, and he's going to come and save you from your sins. And then after this book, it goes, God goes silent for 400 years. It's called the silent 400 years, where there was nothing spoken to the people of Israel for 400 years as God was preparing for the greatest act in human history. And that's where Jesus shows up on the scene. And the division between the Old Testament and the New Testament is right in the middle of that division is Jesus showing up. He's at the center of the Bible. He is the answer. He is the hope of the world. He's not only at the center of the Bible, he's literally at the center of history. Everything changed after Jesus showed up. So the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are a great place to start if you're coming to Jesus for the first time. It's the story of Jesus on earth, living his life and sacrificing himself for our sins. The book of Acts is the story of God, Jesus sending them out. He says, hey guys, now I need you to go out and tell the world, you and me, we're good, but let them know we're good. So he sends them out on a mission and says, go let your light shine around the world and to that they may see your good works. The Acts is the story of those people going out there. Romans is a story, very foundational book of theology, heavy book. But it's Paul basically explaining the Christian faith to the Roman people, the secular people. Then these books here are basically stories of 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. These are books that Paul himself wrote. Paul was a convert to Christianity. He persecuted Christians, but then he became a convert. He's like, oh my gosh, this is actually what else. This is actually the truth. And so he starts writing books to these people that are living in this secular world, this messed up, crooked, and depraved world like he talks about in, in that verse we read earlier today. And he says, this is how you should live out this faith in this world. And he talks in each of these books about very specific challenges. Cor- Corinth was a very kind of depraved, sexually driven city. And so he talks to people in Corinth. He says, look, you can't be doing this. You can't be doing that. Christians don't do that. It, it, it's not what God intended for you. It's not how he built you to operate. And if you do it, you're going to be destroying yourself. Here in Galatians, he's talking to people of Galata. In Ephesians, he's talking to people of Ephesus. He talks to people of Philippi here, Colossae, the people of Thessalonica. Then it's, this is a book, the First and Second Timothy are a book he wrote to a young guy who wanted to get into ministry. And he said, Timothy, here's what you need to know. If you want to get into leadership and into ministry, this is what's really important. So maybe you're trying to get into leadership or ministry. Second Timothy, first and second Timothy have great stuff. Titus and Philemon, interesting books. Philemon was actually written, this guy, he was a slave. He escaped from his master, came, came to Paul, accepted Christ. And Paul says, hey, I think you're supposed to go back to your owner. And the slave says, okay, I'm going to go back to my owner. So Paul writes a letter to the owner, Onesimus, and says, hey, man, don't hold it against this guy that he escaped from you. You're both Christians. So it shows how we relate to each other in this, this ownership, I mean, this uh, like boss to worker relationship. Talk to, if you're a worker, um, if you own slaves, hopefully you don't. I'm going to report you if you do. But it's about how to relate like that, right? It's a weird, it's an interesting book. Hebrews, talk about a crazy book. Okay, I would not recommend starting in Hebrews because it's Paul explaining to the Hebrew mind, the people of Israel, what Jesus came to do, which was completely like, when I read Hebrews, I'm still sometimes like, huh? It's a profound book, heavy. We think Paul wrote Hebrews. James, one of the most practical books in the Bible, talks about how to deal with anger, talks about how to deal with frustration, talks about how to have peace in your heart and mind. First and second Peter, these are great because these are written by the Peter that hung out with Jesus. And remember, Peter was all impetuous and like swinging swords and trying to hurt people. This is older, more mature and wise Peter. 
So you read him, he's like, and you're like, wow, Peter, you used to be crazy. And here is like a more mature Peter. It's kind of hope for those of us who are a little crazy right now. Like you can actually grow up and mature. First, second, third John are about God's love. Amazing books about God's beloved. Let us love one another for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not knoweth not God because God is love. All of this in first John. Jude, fascinating book. We won't get into that. And then Revelation is basically the story of how God's going to wrap up human history. It, it's the apocalypse. Apocalypse means the unveiling. It's the taking off of everything we haven't seen. In fact, in Spanish, the book is called Apocalipsis, if you've ever read the Bible in Spanish. That, my friends, is an overview of the Bible. So if you've been intimidated by it and something's caught your attention, you're like, man, let's check out one of these books. Because right here from the beginning, Genesis, to the end, this book holds the story of God's revelation of himself to man, his unve- unveiling of truth, little by little by little. Just like he unveiled it through three, 4,000 years of history, he wants to unveil his truth in your life, little by little. And every problem you're facing this morning, if you came in here this morning struggling, man, with depression, if you're coming here struggling with anxiety, I relate to all that. And I'll tell you, man, I grew up in church. And I was forced to memorize scripture. And I mean forced. But I can't tell you how many times, man, I'll be struggling with fear or anxiety. And I'll hear the voice in my head that'll say, it's that Bible verse that says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I can't tell you how many times I've thought it was the end. I'm like, oh my gosh. It's the end. It's so dark. Everything is darkness around me. And I hear the verse in my head, the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. I feel hopeless. And I hear the verse, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul. When the truth is in you, the truth will find its way through the darkness. But it's got to be in you. So my, here's my encouragement for you. First, You've got to take time to read it. And and listen, I understand. The Bible's huge, and it's a hard book to understand. I get it. It's still hard for me to understand. But you still got to take the time to read it every day. And and, and here's the thing. I'm not a very good reader. Well, you live in a wonderful time to be alive because, you know, there are apps that will read the Bible to you. You have zero excuse. They'll read the Bible to you. And there's there's Bible reading plans on things like YouVersion. I've written some of them. If you go to the YouVersion Bible app where you can read through like the Bible verse and then application of it, uh, it's all sorts of things. Like, But you've got to be reading it every day. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You've got to put the word in you. If it's not in you, the truth ain't going to come out when you need it. You've got to be constantly exposing yourself to truth. There's a verse that talks about washing yourself with the water of the word. It's like a daily bath. Get all the junk off of you by reading the word of God. And you say, well, I don't understand it. It doesn't matter. Read it. Remember, you don't have to understand it for it to work. Second, why does my computer keep doing this? Pray it. This says pray it. You say, what do you mean pray it? Hey, have you ever, have you ever been in, like, across a room and you heard somebody repeat something that you had said, but they said it as their own words? And you're like, hey, wait a second. I said that. That's what happens when you, when you pray the word of God. You get God's attention because you're using his own words. Because remember, we believe God spoke those words through people. And when you start praying things over your family, like that prayer we prayed earlier for our kids, we pray that they would be lights in a crooked and depraved generation in which they shine like stars in the universe. Lord, I pray that for our kids. When you pray those verses, all of a sudden God's like, hey, I said that. And you get his attention. You've always got his attention. But you know what I mean. It's a good example, right? Pray the word of God. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. Man, dive into the word and figure out how to convert what you read on the page into a prayer for you, for your kids, for your family. Pray the word of God. Third thing, what is going on with this thing? There we go. Memorize it. See, well, I'm not very good at memorizing. Hey, you don't, look, look, you are better at memorizing than you think because I know you know every word to that ghetto rap song. (laughs) Right? Yo, baby, on, take me out. Like, you can memorize crap. I know you can, right? You just got to make it important. You got to say, it's more important that I read, that I memorize this than the, than the most recent thing by uh, Mecklemore, right? Isn't that the, the, the guy you like? Who's the rapper you like? Anyway, my wife likes rap. Anyway, I'm going to pay for that, disclosing that little fact. 
And she knows all the words. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Memorize the word of God. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I can't tell you how many times, you guys, when I'm up here speaking and all of a sudden a verse will pop out. And I'm like, oh, I forgot about that verse. But it was in there. And when it's in there, it'll come out when you need it. But you got to have it in you. You got to memorize it. And then the final thing I would encourage you to do is meditate on it. There went my thing again. Meditate simply means this. You chew on it over and over again. Take a small passage of scripture. You know, cows, you ever notice they're always chewing on something? It's because they're ruminant animals. And a ruminant animal, they've got multiple stomachs. And what they'll do is they'll get a piece of something and they'll chew on it. And then they'll swallow it. And then they'll go, heave it back up and chew on it some more get a little more nutrition from it. They're going to get every ounce of nutrition out of that thing. That's disgusting. But I think that's a pretty good picture of what it's like to meditate on the Word of God. And in Psalm, it says this, he who meditates on the Word of God is like a tree planted by rivers of water. You ever seen these cypress trees down by the Guadalupe River? They've been hanging out there for a long time. Floods have come, droughts have come, but they're still standing strong. And when you meditate on Scripture, I don't understand how, all of how it works. I don't. But it works. You meditate on that scripture. It holds you. It puts your roots deep down when things get hard. Meditate on scripture. And King David, he, he says this, I will meditate on your precepts, on what's in your word, and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word, because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You may be trying to figure out this morning where to go, what to do, what's the next step, how to handle that situation at work, how to handle that financial situation. I guarantee you this, the answer you're looking for is somewhere in the Bible. And the more you get to know the truth in the Bible, the more those truths will reveal themselves to you. If you will wash yourselves constantly, that daily bath in the Word. The Word of God is here to guide you. It is the foundation that you'll build your life on. If you build your life on that, you can be confident that things, you will be walking in the order that God set up for you and you will succeed in this life. But it starts with the foundation of the Word of God, and that never changes. You guys receive that? Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you this morning that you have given us a, a solid foundation that we can build our life upon. The Word of God. Jesus came in the flesh, spoke the truth, and now we have the written Word of God as our source of life and hope and truth. So I pray for those of us, man, this morning, we, we've been intimidated by the Bible. We tried to read it, couldn't understand it. Lord, I pray that you'd just give it a new, a new hunger, a new desire to read that word. And I pray, Lord, you would just, man, even today as they're seeking guidance, reading their Bible today, Lord, I pray that you would just, through your Holy Spirit, make those verses clear to them. Help them to, to understand maybe not all of the complexity of it, but at least how to apply it in their life so they will know how to live the builder, you know how to live in this life. So we thank you and we're trusting you. If you have not given your life to Jesus this morning, you already know who you are. I'm gonna say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer, you mean it in your whole heart, God's gonna transfer you from the kingdom of darkness. He's gonna take you into the kingdom of light, set you up an eternal address in heaven. It starts by saying this prayer. Let's all say this together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.